it's like, why, why not give something a try? Right? Like I, that's my mindset is like, what is, what's going to, what's the worst possible scenario that's going to happen. If you say yes to this thing, maybe you don't 100%, you're not sure you're a little hesitant, but what's the worst thing that could come out of it. If you're still going to be safe, right? This is not like an unsafe thing that you're doing. You're going to be safe, but you're, it's uncomfortable, right? That's the, I think for a lot of people, they get, they're like, oh, I, that's going to be uncomfortable. That's going to be hard. Or I don't know. It's the fear of the unknown. It's that, you know, it's going to, what if I, what if I'm not good at that thing? Welcome to another episode of the Limitless Live Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Smith, and if you have not done so, hit that subscribe button so that you never miss another podcast. And if you love this podcast and you want some more tips and tricks on how to improve yourself, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. There are a ton of instructional videos. You can find the links down below. However, before you go ahead and do that, I would love for you to stick around for Meredith Bauman. Hello. <laughs> Hi. How are you? That was doing great. Today? Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was a well, lot of energy. I loved it. I, I appreciate I'm, that. I like to uh try try my best. What are you gonna say there? Sorry. No, I was gonna say I'm doing well. Thank you. And how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Uh and we were definitely going into some knowledge bombs without recording, and uh the time flew by there for a little bit. I'm like, ah shit. Yeah, we should probably record so that we can actually log some of the cool little tidbits or shares and conversations that we got going on. But nonetheless, I have a beginner question to get things started off, and then we can go down all the rabbit holes we wish. Sounds good. How is it, Meredith, that you impact the lives of the people around you? Oh, wow. That's, it's such a great question. I feel like that is also a loaded question. Um, I think about personally, like I have a six-year-old daughter. So I think about the impact that I would have on her. That might be slightly different than the impact I would have on the people around me that I would impact professionally. So my daughter, she's six. And I really want to always make sure that I'm showing her unconditional love and support and also empowering her and having her grow up independent and those things. And I always want to lead by example. I always want to be the, the mom who is going to show her that she doesn't have to, you know, be a martyr in life and those types of things that she can take care of herself and she can, you know, put good food into her body and she can move her body in ways that she enjoys. Um, and she can do all the things that she loves in life, but she doesn't have to sacrifice necessarily those things for herself. I think that's important for me to show her that, you know, mom is there for her no matter what, but also that I'm there for myself too. And that she sees that. So she grows up being one of those, you know, women that's going to put herself as a priority as much as she can. So that's a, that's a big impact, obviously having a little one. And then professionally, professionally, I wear lots of different hats. And so I think that that, that changes a little bit depending on the group that I'm working with. I've been a registered massage therapist for 17 years, which projected me down on the path of, I think helping people would be probably the biggest thing. Helping people with massage therapy is a lot of like physical, you know, you're physically helping them to feel better, but also creating a safe space for them to be able to share, you know, knowing that they can share things with me and it's confidential and, and that, you know, I'm a safe space to be able to, um, really they can let their guard down and their walls down. And I do that also with my nutrition clients that I work with too. I think that's one of the biggest things. I'm a really empathetic person. Mm-hmm. And I feel like as a coach that comes through with the people that I work with. Um, and I want people to feel safe and I want to be able to empower them. I want them to um, have a self of, you know, that self-efficacy where they feel like they're in control of the things that they are doing. And then I also teach as well. And so I'm working with students, teaching them. uh, I work in a nutrition coaching program as well. So then I'm impacting my students in that way where I'm helping to empower them and them to be able to step into, you know, the, the best version of themselves and that sort of thing. So there's lots of different aspects to that, but I think it comes down to impacting people with helping them with 
leadership as well. I look at myself as being a leader. It feels weird to talk about myself in, in that way, but I'm also big in my community, like a community leader where I do lots of like volunteering and I'm one of the first ones that, you know, will raise my hand to say, yeah, I'll, I'll help with that. And so I think I have a big impact in regards to showing people um, that they can also step up as a leader too, and that they can take charge and they can be somebody that um, can make it an impact in a positive way, whether that's from one person or a community perspective. Mm. That was a lot. I don't know. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was absolutely fantastic. I, I really like how you categorized it where you put it into as a parent, but, and then also as a professional. Um, so as a person, how do you lead yourself? Oh yeah. That's, a, that's another great question. I feel like over the years, I've gotten much better at that. Um, that I'm like a lot kinder to myself. I think that's probably one of the biggest things I have worked a lot of my mindset. I'm a certified mindset coach too. And so that's been a huge thing for me taking that, like that, getting that knowledge and that certification not only has helped me to be able to help other people, but it's helped myself, like taking a look at my mindset and the way that I view things and think about things and myself. And I very much am always trying to carve out um, how to take care of myself in the best way while serving others, because mm -hmm. the work that I do is taking care of other people and helping them to take care of themselves. But then sometimes I can get lost along the way a little bit. And I've, I've, gone through periods of where I've been in like burnout mode where I'm like, Oh my goodness, I can't do any more of this. But then I've, I think I've learned over the years when those symptoms are coming up so that I have to stop and just say like, I got to set better boundaries. I got to use the word no, which is a complete sentence, right? Those are all things that I'm practicing that I never, that I didn't really do before. And I think as I get older, not to age myself, but as I get older, I feel like it learn more have more experience, have more knowledge, then I start to get better at taking care of myself and putting myself, I say to my clients a lot of times, there's, as moms, we want to put our family and our kids first, right? It's like, that's our priority. It's really hard for moms to prioritize themselves. And one of the perspectives I like to have is that we don't always have to put ourselves first because that feels a little selfish, especially for moms. That's hard to do, but we can put ourselves in the mix, right? Like, why can't I take care of myself at the same level that I take care of everybody else? It's only fair for me to do that because who else is going to do that for me? Who else knows inside my body if I'm feeling burnout mode or not? I need to be able to recognize those things and, you know, listen to myself, my body when it's talking to me and say, okay, I, I'm allowed to take care of myself at that same level so that I'm not always putting people ahead of me all the time, that I'm in the mix with everybody else. I think that's probably one of the biggest things over the last few years, for sure, especially becoming a mom, you have to figure out that, that balance a little bit more. I like the, uh, reframe of putting yourself in the mix. It's, it's still including it's, it's looking at yourself as a part of the, as a conduit to a cycle where yeah. the energy comes in, the energy goes out, the energy comes in, the energy goes out rather than energy out, energy out, energy out, energy out. It's like, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta get into the mix to actually like, flow through things and well, bring, bring, bring your most abundant self. Yeah. I think it's always that putting on your own oxygen mask first before you can help other people. That's hard to do, but also you're not going to help anyone if you're not ever putting something back into your own cup, right? Like we can't mm -hmm. pour from that empty cup. And that's a, a big lesson, I think, for a lot of moms, especially. And I'm saying that because I am one and I work with a lot of moms, but it's really hard. They deplete themselves fully and then they don't know how to get started or where to even go from there. So I think if you can keep it at that, you know, you don't have to be full to the brim, but you also can't run on empty. So you have to find somewhere on that spectrum in between totally empty and, you know, overflowing. Let's find some middle ground there so that we can continue to take care of all those other people that we have on our plate to take care of. Mm. I like that. I like that quite a bit. I, uh, I like putting relations into a category I call fellowship. And I define that as the people that we make space for. Yeah. And being able to be really clear 
on the person that you want to be for all the others, as well as yourself, uh, can positively can, can help reflect on reputation and mm -hmm. think of the reputation that you have with yourself, which can also go with the reputation of what your past selves would also look at you today as. And, right. uh, you know, I was actually a pretty, pretty little, a uh, little flow on this one. Cause something that I really liked with uh, a post that you made that it's, it's a long one, so I'm not going to read it, but you can definitely add some <laughs> more context. Yep. But, uh, I like how you finished it where you, you said, if you could, what would you tell your younger self? Yeah. And, uh, out of curiosity, I'll ask the question, then you can go, you can go into any sort of rabbit hole you can go down. I would like to flip that and see what your just raw answer would be. If what would your younger self, and you can go with, I believe the most impactful times were six, 12 and 20. Were those the times yeah. that you had in your post? Yeah, it sure was. So if you have six, 12 and 20, what would each of them think about who you are today? Ooh. Oh yeah. That's, that is, uh, actually that, that's really intense to think about actually. I, it I, is. Yeah, it is. it is. So I think my, I think that even anyone that knew me in elementary school or high school, probably like anyone that follows me on Facebook or finds me on Instagram, I think a lot of times they're almost in a way surprised, but in a, in a good way, like they're surprised of what I do even for, for work and, and that sort of thing. I was always somebody that helped people. Like I was always that person in high school. I volunteered for everything. I was always somebody who was trying to help somebody else who needed a, needed a tutor or just needed a, a hand with something. And so I don't think that that would be surprising, but also, you know, I used to be 60 pounds heavier. And so I think that like, if people look at some of my posts and they see that I've become more of an athlete, I think that's probably surprising. Um, and I think that they probably, a lot of them just get in a way shocked of they're like, oh, I was like, Meredith is doing these things with her life just because I don't think that that was how I was perceived in my younger years or in high school or that kind of stuff. Um, but I think those younger versions of myself would be really proud, <laughs> be proud of myself for the, the work that I've done on myself and how I, how I show up and help other people too. And that I didn't let that stop me from coming into my own in the way that I have. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know it almost makes me emotional. <laughs> That's fair. Hopefully in a good way. <laughs> yes. In a good way. Okay. Now I want to, I want to flip it on you. Sure. And because that impacted you, that, that question, mm -hmm. what would you, what would you say to your younger self if you could reflect back on a time in your life when it was maybe a, a turning point for you or something like that? Is there something that you would go back and tell your younger self? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I say that like I say that like I would say a bunch, but there's there's probably because I I do reflect often. And so I, I kind of think of it in like, a, if I could go back in time and it was, it was a time bubble. So nothing, nothing changed. I don't want any butterfly effect shenanigans going on. Like back to the future <laughs> stuff. I just watched a couple breakdowns and I'm like, I don't want to have that kind of sequence of events happen. So it That's would be fair. very specific. It'd be a little time bubble where I could just chat with my younger self. And I think one of the most, a couple of the prominent times one kind of visualization that I had, which is a little bit more tact tactical, I guess, <clears throat> that I've used is uh, when I think of the most in, when I think of the time where I wasn't quite lost or, but I was like kind of whew, like overwhelmed or just shenanigans, like shenanigans I was going on. And it was around the age of nine. I would say nine would probably be one of my most pivotal, pivotal years of existence. And then 26 would definitely be up there. And then what am I? I'm 30. So it'd be 31 would also be another one. 
So I think those three, would, I want to pick three because you had three. So I wanted to like yeah. level it out. Uh, so uh, starting with youngest, uh, something that I've done with this one, and I might get all feels on this one because this is like heavy shit. But uh, something that something that I think of is, this is a thought. <clears throat> it's until the day that we choose to do so, where we consciously make the decision to do so, we will show up for our inner child as our parents showed up for us. So if we're able to change the relationship to the the person that we need or needed or maybe even not needed but would have been a little bit more of a helpful guidance mm -hmm. and if we can visualize ourselves as that person so i visualize myself presently as that person for my nine-year-old self right. so if i get the opportunity to to like think and speak to my younger self i take it from a place of looking down on him and pointing at him and telling him what he has to do and like the the initial uh coaching on parenting that I've gotten previously. And there's goods and bads, right? But I'm thinking specifically for the parts that don't strengthen us. The not I, I want to decrease the uh the I want to decrease the amount of pushing and holding. Hmm. There's a specific word that I want to go for, but it's not quite popping up, but I want to make sure that the good stuff is popped up there. It's like really bring it there. So then in that moment where I'm looking at my younger self, that's one point where it's awareness of that. And it's like, I don't want to talk at you. I want to talk with you. So then it goes from standing to kneeling eye level. At that point, I could just be like, little Kyle, man, like you're going through some tough stuff right now, but this is also going to be foundational for who you will become totally and then being able to bring that little one in rather than allowing that inner toddler that inner toddler inner toddlers tantruming to divert progress in the present right so then it goes that then the third part is it goes from that hold that hug to both both of us are looking in the same direction with a common goal so it goes from being talked at being spoken to or listened to articulating a vision that both people can work towards together so that would probably be my nine-year-old one <laughs> and then 26 uh what i 26 would be pivotal because i did uh, the world's toughest mutter. And I talked about that a bunch on a couple podcasts, but that one was one where I really, uh, I put it as I broke down the body to build up the mind. So I, I was not happy with my reputation actually. Okay. There we go. I would actually say to myself at that point in time that your reputation sucks right now, but you will be changing it. I think that's what the, that's what it would be actually. Ooh. Ooh, That's good. This is a good catalyst conversation because I wouldn't have made those two little connections there. Sick. Uh, and then 30, you yeah. Said 33, I think. 33 is present. Right now, I would just tell myself to keep on going. <laughs> but 31 would be uh, just two years ago. What would I say to myself two years ago? I would... I probably wouldn't change anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good to, reflection though. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, I think that's probably the one of the better case scenarios, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah. But those would probably be good little flip a roo on that one, but that's probably what I would tell my younger selves. Yeah, and I don't think it even has to be like a changing of anything, but more of like you you have so much more life experience and learning and growth and all of those things, right? It's almost that like reassurance to your younger self that like, no matter what happens, you're on the right path and you're going to end up being where you want to be, right? Like you just said, I wouldn't change anything. So all of those things that happened in your life all got you to where you were. I think sometimes it's even just that, like, like you said, the things that you needed to hear or feel when you were younger, um, 
you know, if you could reassure that younger person that everything's going to be okay, or everything's going to work out or whatever it might be, um, the things that you needed to hear in that moment that maybe you didn't get to hear and your, yourself could tell you, tell you that to just hang in there. Cause it's going to be okay. Right. You're, you're on the right path. It's going to all work out those types of things. Totally. Yeah. Uh, I thought that I want to share with you on this one and it's a quote I shared it on the last podcast too that I recorded, but it's a quote by Charles Bukowski and uh, he's a poet. And what do you say? He said, people insist on clearing the mind, clear the fucking heart instead. Mm. And that's been, I adopted a little mantra out of there where it's clear the heart and the mind will follow, clear the heart and the mind will follow. So when we're talking about, uh, the younger self, the, the the younger aspects talking to our younger self and how it impacts us today in the present, but be, being able to go back then and kind of influence and impact and create that safe space for that little yeah. version of us. That's, that's what kept on popping up is cl clear the heart and the head will follow because we're going upstream of the feelings that we get to feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. That's neat. So after those little rabbit holes. Yeah. Wow. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, do you have an idea of uh, where this desire or this pull towards uh, helping people comes from? Um, I think part of it is the way that I was raised for one thing, like my, my dad is still that kind of a person. He's very much a community person, like always there to help his siblings or a, a neighbor or whatever it might be. He's always very much like involved in things. Um, my mom, my mom always had this, like, well, she, my mom has this huge heart, but she was always had this really inviting um, space in our house where our door was like a revolving door when I was a kid of like all the kids in the neighborhood that needed a mom. And my mom was that mom. <laughs> like our house was like a safe space. If you needed to come and you needed a, a hot meal or a bed to sleep in or whatever it might be, that was our, our house. And so I think with that, it was something that I was raised with. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, that it was, a something instilled in me from a young age, I think. Um, something that I recently went down a rabbit hole about was a friend um, in the last couple of years, she was like, do you know what Enneagram number you are? And I don't know, Kyle, if you do Enneagrams. I don't. Um, You'll have to give me some insights. Oh, okay. I feel like you might find this interesting. So uh, Enneagram, there's a test that you can take. So she's like, I'm pretty sure you're this number. She thought it was a three uh, based on the characteristics. So the Enneagram is a bit of like a character thing, but it's based on your motivations to do do things. Mm. And it's been really insightful for me to learn about my <laughs> Enneagram because it, I feel like it's answered a lot of like questions for me or affirmed things for me of like why I am the way that I am. Mm. So I took the test and it was interesting. It was, uh, I'm an Enneagram two, which is categorized as the helper. And I'm a, I'm a two with a wing three. So you have a number on each side. So if I'm a two, I'd either be have a wing one or a wing three and you pull characteristics from that other number. So I pull from a three, which is very like self-motivated, goal oriented, likes to get tasks done. Um, and then they're considered the host. And that's always the person that I've been. I'm the one that's like, you know, come into my house, just like my mom, right? Come into my house. I will take care of you. I will feed you. I will give you a drink. What do you need? Right. I was always the the friend growing up <laughs> that I'd go with my girlfriends and somebody would, you know, forget their ID or their car keys or whatever. And like, I would have grabbed it or I would have the, the spare, whatever. Like my friends joke around now about Oh, just ask Meredith. She probably has like a screwdriver in her purse because she has everything that you might need. Cause I'm always like thinking ahead to take care of everybody. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm the helper, but I'm the host and all of these characteristics that got listed, it was like these light bulbs were going off. And I was like, that's, that's so me. That's totally who I am. It listed the, the careers of a Enneagram two. And it was like Enneagram twos tend to be uh, massage therapists, nutrition coaches, personal trainers, I literally am all of those things. <laughs> and it was just, it was almost just mind blowing to me that I fit into this, 
this number that just made so much sense. So then learning about it, I feel like I was like, I feel like it's more of just like, that's the innate kind of person that I am. Like I was yeah. literally born that way. And I, I feel like it made sense. So yes, environmental, my mom, my dad, big influence that how they, you know, live their lives and live their lives. But also that part of it was just super insightful to me because I was like, this makes sense. Like my, the way that I am makes sense. So my motivation as a two is to feel appreciated mm. and like, words for affirmation or words of affirmation for me are huge. If somebody says to me, you know, I'm, I'm volunteering, I'm helping somebody. If someone's like, thank you so much, or I really appreciate all that work you did. That's what lights me up. Like I, I want to help people, but that's part of that motivation is like, if you make me feel appreciated, I will do all of the things for you. Like I will, you can count on me, right? If, if you're going to make me feel like I was able to help you, then I will continue to be that person that you can rely on. And I will, I will be there for you. So I think it's, that's, that's been a big piece for me. And I know some people maybe listening might be like, don't know Enneagram might be a little woo woo. That's fine. It has, it's been a big change for me. It's been helpful for me just to learn that about myself and also feel like, oh, this makes sense. It's not, I, I'm not crazy in some way for having these characteristics about myself that's just the way that I am. And it's almost allowed me to accept certain things about myself. If that makes sense. <laughs> totally. It just added a couple more layers of understanding. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, you know, like that somebody might, their brain might work a certain way and my brain works another way, or my motivation to do something might be different from someone else's. And it just kind of made sense to me, just having another piece of information to, to add. I don't just go by that. Oh, I do these things because I'm an Enneagram too, but it's sometimes it's, oh, that makes sense. That's a two thing. And it's very much a characteristic. Somebody else might go through life thinking or doing something a different way because they have a different motivation. They have a different reason why they might be doing that thing or reacting to something the way that they do because of their characteristics that they have. Um, so that, yeah, that's just been a, a piece of it. I think for me is taking a look, you talked about reflecting, but like reflecting on my past and my childhood, and then also looking at some of those other things. And I think all those little bits of information that you can learn about yourself or what could be true I think that just adds another layer to things. And it just has allowed me to, I think, to understand myself on a, a whole other level. I like that. <clears throat> I actually have a thought that's kind of, that's kind of, kind of goes with this one. Pulling out a couple thoughts. It's pretty cool. Uh, the things I, the thing that I find interesting is, and I was like this before, the hesitancy to, try something or observe something like let's say it was an Enneagram or let's say it's like could be something similar to astrology or numerology. Uh, and the thing that I think is interesting or how, how I've organized things is because those things are conceptual, they can work as long as there's the belief. So, you know, some folks will be like, oh, it, it, it doesn't work. Well, it's because you don't believe it works. Right. And I think because I think that we're in a time of conceptual survival because we're in a really abundant area. So it's survival of the mind. So if we can adopt something that can progress us or encourage us or inspire us to progress towards the vision that we want and it's conceptual and it, whether it's, whether some people believe it's real or not is irrelevant whether it is yeah. verifiable or not is kind of irre irrelevant as well because people will say they accomplished this because of that or this is something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I'll definitely check out the Enne Enneagram because I like that kind of stuff. And along with that too is that's just another that's just another form of information about yourself that pops up. And something that's kind of cool, I've been really noticing it last year, but the more that I've been learning about myself internally and just trying to go deep, 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 uh, is that, and it's so funny because I think it's kind of cliche to say, but when you start learning more about yourself, you start to learn how little, you know, mm -hmm. and that's such a clusterfuck. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's like, 
it's so interesting where it's like as you're unraveling the because you're a mindset coach and I like the definition of mindset being what you think about yourself. So going into the mindset of what you think about yourself, it's like, well, what you think about yourself then goes into what do you understand about yourself? What do you feel about yourself? Mm -hmm. What do you like? It goes deep, deep. Mm -hmm. It's like that uh, five whys, like ask a question or ask yourself why five times and you'll get to the very root of it. And it's kind of interesting. It's interesting that we're yeah. just like the the nesting dolls of just like going just into the yeah. abyss of unknowing ourselves. You're like an onion. You got to peel back all the layers, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was just uh, thinking about what, what you said with uh, if you don't believe it, it's probably not going to work for you. And I've actually experienced that even like being a massage therapist mm -hmm. for 17 years. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how there's people that they don't, they don't believe even that massage therapy can help them, right? Whether they've had chronic illness for a long time, or they just think it's like a woo woo thing. We're like, Oh, you know, I don't think, I don't think that this is really going to help me, but my, you know, I got a referral and, or my friend told me I should give it a try. And then it's like, I I'm a pretty damn good therapist. I've been doing this for a long time. I've done a lot of treatments. I have a lot of education and knowledge and experience. I, I help people all the time. And it's amazing to me that people still have this block where they're just like, I don't, I don't think this is going to help me, but I'm going to come for a treatment anyways. And I'm like, the chances of you actually having a positive experience or having a significant change from coming for a treatment is, has exponentially gone down because you don't believe that you can get better or you don't believe that this is going to help you. Like it's, it, it, that's not going to help you at all. If you go into it with that mindset where you're like, well, I don't think this is going to help me, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's like, you're probably not going to have a pretty good, like you're not going to have a good experience that way. So people that are more open to, I don't know if this is going to help me, but I'm definitely open to this. You know, I'm going to give it a try. And I'm going to see what happens. Um, that is, you know, much better mindset to go into something than, you know, oh, that's, that doesn't work or that's not going to work for me, that sort of thing. So it's even interesting. My own dad, he, um, at one point his, you know, his back was bothering him. And I was like, I was like, Hey dad, let me do a quick assessment on you. And I was like, I'm pretty sure you have like a rib out here and a rib out there. And I was like, you got to go to the chiropractor. And he's like, okay. And so he goes to the chiropractor and then he's like, calls me. He's like, guess what? I had ribs out exactly where you said, I was like, really? I was like, yeah, you did. I had a pretty good feeling or his feet were bothering him. And I was like, pretty sure you have plantar fasciitis. Try doing these things, but I can't diagnose. So go and get checked up with a doctor, chiropractor, whatever. And then he's like, I have plantar fasciitis. And they told me to do all the things that you told me to do. And I was like, yeah, dad, I'm not just guessing. Like, I'm not, I'm not just like, like grasping at straws, trying to like tell you some random thing. I actually do know what I'm talking about. It was just interesting how he just didn't even think that I had the, the the answers for him right until he heard it from another source. So sometimes I think it's that too, right? People are just like, mm, I don't know. I don't know about this thing. I don't know if I believe that. Well, it's, it's not necessarily going to work for you if you're totally closed off to it either. Mm -hmm. Two, two thoughts that popped up on that one. That's a quick one is uh, it's funny. It's funny how often we resist advice from loved ones who we trust and we're so right? quick to take on advice and anything from strangers. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting little twist. And I don't know if that's just, he was like, Oh, like my daughter is a professional who knows. It's not like he's ever doubted me before. Right. Oh. I don't think it was that. I think it was more of a, I've had, I've had clients, the massage clients who um, their wife, say if it's a male client in particular, their wife could be saying, you need to drink more water and you have to go for a massage and this and this and this, like telling them all the things you got to stretch more, whatever it might be. They come see me do a treatment. I'm like, okay, here's your home care. I need you, you know, drinking this much water. These are the stretches I need you to do this many times per week. You need to come back for another treatment. And they're like, yep, sounds good. And then their wives go, I have been saying that to him for five years and he has not drank a glass of water until you told him to drink a glass of water. And I was like, yeah, it's because you're his wife and I'm his therapist. So there's that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I actually, I do think that that's kind of broad uh, among 
almost all relationships. Right. Like, <laughs> like kids, kids don't want to listen to their parents, but then you have another adult say the same thing. It could work right. that way as well. It could be, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, something else that popped up as we were talking about, uh, um, at least being willing to try something. I think that's something that's really cool with the, well, one that else that you said, no is a complete sentence. Do you think mm. yes is a complete sentence as well? I think it can be. I think so too. Yeah. Sick. Yes. So going, <laughs> there. that, that yeah, one actually period. had, <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> uh, the actual, the other thought before that one was when we have, when we decide that we're okay with saying yes to uh, a new experience, a novel experience, I think that it takes us, it could get, get us uh, a moment, a moment away from that, uh, the particular experience that we're having, having, because then we're put into a new spot. And I'm actually thinking of a friend of mine, uh, Daniel, he did actually my buddy Calvin more, more, uh, closely, he did his very first sound bath retreat. And I would say out of the two of us, we've been friends since, since we were like for almost two decades now, I would definitely say that I was, I'm probably a little bit more on the woo side. And I think that he's just getting more into the woo side or he's just been hiding his wooness, which I think is more accurate, but he called me and uh, he was telling me about this sound bath that he had, this experience that he had where he was like, yeah, it was like sound bath and there was a couple sounds and they were going through the whole thing and he was experiencing it and he's got a really racing mind and he, he did not, he's like, I'm just going to go in to chill and just experience what's like, I'm not going to think about anything. I'm just going to be. And so he went in, he like just chillaxed and he did uh, some breathwork stuff and then like there's a a whole ceremony that they did and it was something like two hours long so it was pretty good and he said that he had like a full experience like like he had like uh just reflections he didn't trip out or anything like that but he had reflections and he was like wow like he was just the main message that he got was uh he's been and i thought this was a crazy cool reflection he's been re rewriting the same chapter for the last chunk of time and he believes that he is now intuitively pulled towards writing his new chapter. And I thought that was a sick reflection. So with the, with the, with the uh, willingness to say yes to a novel experience, we can find ourselves with an insight we normally wouldn't have had if we were resistant to trying out an experience where we may not believe it is kind right. of the thought that popped up. Yeah, I think with that, it's like, why why not give something a try, right? Like, I, that's my mindset is like, what is, what's going to, what's the worst possible scenario that's going to happen if you say yes to this thing? Maybe you don't 100%, you're not sure, you're a little hesitant, but what's the worst thing that could come out of it? If you're still going to be safe, right? This is not like an unsafe thing that you're doing. You're going to be safe, but you're, it's uncomfortable right? That's the, I think for a lot of people, they get, they're like, oh, I, that's going to be uncomfortable. That's going to be hard. Or I don't know. It's the fear of the unknown. It's that, you know, that's going to, what if I, what if I'm not good at that thing? What if this doesn't work? Right. So it's that fear of failure or that fear of the unknown that can come up for people too. But really, if you can say like, all right, worst case scenario, what's the worst thing that could happen in this situation? What are the chances of that thing happening? <laughs> what are the chances of something positive or good that could come out of this experience. So just because it feels uncomfortable, I love that quote that the comfort place is a beautiful place to, to live, but nothing ever grows there, right? Our comfort zone, we live there, it feels good, but we don't actually grow there. We can't actually expand ourselves. And so putting ourselves into uncomfortable or hard situations like this, this is my first time being on a podcast. I haven't done this before but I'm only going to be able to grow and learn and improve from doing something one time. And you have to be okay with, you know, being shitty or crappy or sucking at something to be able to get better at something. Cause you have to be able to put in the reps and do the practice and whatever it might be. But even if you only do it one time, you're still going to get something out of it. That's likely not the worst case scenario that you may be made out in your mind. 
Mm. And so I think a lot of times I'm just like, why not? Why not give that thing a try? Why not say yes to something that could potentially grow and expand me? I guess is, is the mindset and the saying the no, the no is a complete sentence, just going back to that and we're backtracking. But with that, it's very much like the setting of the boundaries, right? Of the, I can say yes to things that will grow and expand me, but also is that a hell yes? Or is that, uh, mm, I don't know. Am I doing it because I'm doing it saying yes for somebody else's purposes? Am I saying yes, because I feel obligated to say yes, or am I, saying yes for myself. And I think for me saying no has been hard to say no to things and to set boundaries around stuff. But I think the more that I get comfortable being uncomfortable saying no, because it, for me, it does feel uncomfortable because I think people expect me to say yes, a lot of times to things because I'm, I am a helper and I am somebody that does a lot of things for other people. So when I say no, they're almost taken aback. Oh, wait, what you said? No, Mm. why? I don't have to explain myself to you. <laughs> I don't have to have a reason behind it. I can say no and that can be it. And that's hard to do. It's not easy to do, but it's something that I'm I'm working on. I think something that a lot of people probably listening, that's something that they have to work on too or feel like they could do a better job of, of just like, why do I feel the need to have to say no and then have all of these reasons listed for why I'm saying no? I could also just be honest and say no and then have the truth people lots of times feel like they say no. And then they have to like, oh, I said no to doing that thing. But then I said it was because like my sister's coming and then I'm really busy and I have all this stuff. And like, but my sister's not actually coming, but I just didn't want that person to feel bad. It's like, well, you could just tell the truth. You could just say, no, I'm tired. And I don't feel like going to that thing. That's hard. It feels uncomfortable, but we can do that. And the person on the other end, if they don't understand, that's kind of on them, right? Like those feelings that they have, I can't take that on. I can't be responsible for somebody else feeling disappointed because I said, no, they can figure that stuff out. That's their, that's their job to figure out their feelings. It's my job to honor myself and my feelings. So again, down a rabbit hole on that one, but I kind of wanted to (laughs) explain a little bit further, I guess what I meant by the, the no and setting the boundaries. That's what it feels like to me anyways, something that I'm working on that others could probably relate to. That was a knowledge bomb drop. (laughs) Uh, Oh, good. uh, A note that I'm just writing down there because it was really good. Like a good mantra note. You can say no without adopting the other person's feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. That was a good, I'm glad you looped back around in that one. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Damn. That was really cool. Uh, Oh, shoot. I thought I had a, no, I think that was that was pretty much it on that one. Hmm. I had a thought, and then you just like you fluttered Sorry, it I away. I took you out of it. I took you out of the yeah. out of your zone <laughs> yeah. there. I was just along for the ride, and then <laughs> the thought just went boom. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I right. keep thinking okay. about. Okay, go ahead. I remember now. So. So with the idea, with the idea of what could go wrong, so the what if, what if X happens? What if the worst case scenario happens? I like to reframe that so that there's an informed decision, so that there's a contrast. It's like, it's a, what if the good shit? So what if the good shit happens? What would that look like? Mm. And then that way you can make an informed decision as to whether or not you want to say yes or no, but you're not just, and I think that we're, I think for well, we're all inherent. We all have a negativity bias because a negativity bias has been the way that we have been able to survive for so long. But a negativity bias doesn't serve us as well now because we're saying no to things that can improve our lives rather than thinking, oh my gosh, there's going to be a lion in the bushes. There's going to be a tiger. It's going to kill me. And it ends up being or, or it could be an animal that I can consume. There's rustling. It's, I don't know. And then we just assume the worst case scenario because that has the highest probability of being able to, you know, keep us alive. But I think, what if the good shit, what if the good shit, what if the good shit, Meredith, what do you think of that? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's a great way of like making sure you look at both sides of it. So that you're not just thinking what's the worst case scenario, but it's also worst case scenario, but what's the best, what's the best case scenario? What could happen? What could come out of this? 
right? All of these things. I think if you have evidence too, if you can put that down on paper even and like do your pros and cons, if you're trying to make a decision on something, then, you know, do the cons and do the pros. There's probably a good chance that the the pros win out, right? Of like, when I weigh these two things and look at what I'm wagering, you know, if I go for it, there's, there's a good chance that like these things will come out of it that are a positive thing. So I think it's really important, as you said, to look at both of those things. Like, what about, what if this good shit happens and I'm going to miss out on it if I don't take that opportunity? So I think that's really hard. Like we're talking about saying yes to things and not missing out on opportunities. And then we're talking about saying no and setting boundaries. But I think you need to be able to do both those things to recognize when you're honoring your own feelings in your own self of like saying no, or am I saying yes for myself, either way, you should be saying no or yes for, for yourself, right. To that, mm. like honoring what you need to be doing for you in that moment. So am I saying no to something because I'm scared? Am I saying no to it because it's going to put me in danger or am I, you know, saying no, just because, um, you know, because I, I have a fear of that failure or whatever it might be, or not looking like I'm smart enough or good enough, or, you know, that I'm not the best at this thing. And so I don't want to look silly if I do it. And so if I just say no, then I'm going to protect myself. Right. I think it's that, Mm -hmm. that back and forth a little bit, but I think you have to continue to practice that practice saying no, and you have to practice saying yes on on both ends of it. A word that kind of popped up as you were talking about that, I was like, oh, because both of them are decisions. So Mm -hmm. the skill to develop is discernment, the ability to make good quality decisions or yeah, to have that informed decision. So it's then if you have discernment and you can make an informed decision, then you can pick, pick which is appropriate at the given time. Yeah, totally. Damn. Well, Meredith, you dropped some solid knowledge bombs and uh, I appreciate you being here. You're solid. You're cool stuff. I think that your Instagram has a very good vibe to it. You have a very good energy. And I think that you're helping many, many people. And I think that you're going to help many more to come. Thanks, Kyle. And thanks for having me on today. That It's been a lot of fun. It's, I'm happy to get to know you a little bit more too. And um, I appreciate you, you know, reaching out and asking me to be here. So that's awesome. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, three questions I like to close things out with. Technically it's two, but I just figured this last one, I mentioned it so many times, but uh, <laughs> is there anything that has to be said that hasn't been said yet? Um, I don't think so. Nothing that's coming to, to mind based on what we talked about. I feel like we had a pretty good conversation. So I think I can just probably leave it at that. Nice. Cool. I like to double check just in case. <laughs> Now for the actual heavy hitter questions, which I've g- given you a couple already, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, but for context, it's the end of your days. You are laying on your deathbed. You're surrounded by the people that you care for, the people that you have helped in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. What piece of advice do you want to pass on before you kick the bucket? Oh, I hear this question being asked uh, on different in different ways a lot of times on podcasts. I always find it interesting what people say. First of all, I think thinking about being on the deathbed for one thing and then having that like piece of advice, it's hard to know, first of all, what you would say because there's so much more life left to live. I don't know if anyone's ever <laughs> said that before, but I'm, you know, I'm going to be 38 this month. And so I just think, I hope I have many, many, many more years to live and so much more life experience and knowledge. So I'm not sure exactly what that would accumulate to on my deathbed. Um, But I think, yeah, one of the biggest things, I'm always talking about being kind, you know, being kind to yourself, being kind to other people. That's probably one of the biggest things. I think that's what people get remembered for too. You know, let's talk about like the way that you make people feel. Um, I even think about, you know, myself in high school and I run into people sometimes that I went to high school with and they, they, a lot of times they'll say to me, I always remember you being just like the kindest person, the nicest person. I'm always like, Oh, thank you. Like if that's how I leave things is that somebody's like, she was helpful. She was kind. Then that's what I would say, you know, to people is like, if I can lead by example with that, that's what I would want to, you know, leave, leave with people. 
be kind, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and uh, don't be afraid to to lend a hand. I like that. The being kind really resonates. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. I say that to my daughter. I say that to my daughter every morning, you know, she goes to leave the house and get on the bus. And I'm always like, you know, have fun, listen to your teachers, be kind, Mm -hmm. be kind. I like yell at her. And then I, and then I also say, be your weird self as she runs out the door because I want her to just be herself. Right. And then maybe that's a, maybe that's my piece of advice too, is for all the other like weirdos out there. Uh, Just be yourself. And no matter what that looks like, be, be your, your weird self. And I think with my daughter, I just want her to just like be her and not change anything about herself. Um, no matter what that looks like, if someone else thinks you're weird, I'm always like, great. I hope that I'm weird because weird means I'm different and weird means I'm unique and people like weird people, especially when we're kind and we are helpful. And by weird, I just mean, you know, each to their own, but somebody that might say to me like, Oh, you're such a, you're such a weirdo. I would say like, oh, I'm also funny. And I'm, you know, I'm a, such a good friend and I'm empathetic and I'm helpful and all these things. But also, yeah, I'd like to make people laugh and I like to do goofy things that someone's going to smile, you know, about. And I like to just be myself. And I hope that my daughter and other people can just like embrace who they are and just be the, their weird selves too. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely a weirdo. That resonates. <laughs> good. Weirdos yeah. unite. We get t-shirts or something. Totally. <laughs> You know what? Uh, a buddy of mine, Jeremy, Jeremy Grun- Grunsteiner, uh, his podcast is the Weird and Strong podcast. And he actually got, oh. he was inspired by that from uh, someone who he worked, he worked at a gym and they were exchanging, like one of the group activities was exchanging notes and they were just a letter to someone. And a friend of his gave him a letter and it said at the bottom, uh, keep, keep being weird and strong. And so he just, took that it was pretty cool i just wrote that down i'm gonna look at that podcast because anyone can who can embrace their weirdness i'm i'm all for it nice i dig that yeah so the final question the very best version of you that you envision is sitting next to you right now what piece of advice does she have for this season of your life Oh, this season of my life. I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about the season of life that I'm in. I'm in the trenches of motherhood right now. So I have a six-year-old. So I feel like that's, that's part of it. Um, And so probably, you know, that, that best version or that older version of myself, again, will be a little bit wiser and have more experience and those sort of things. So probably um, just the advice would probably be to keep learning, keep, being open to um, advice from people that have more knowledge and experience than you do and keep just doing your, the best that you can. And that is good enough because a lot of times I think that we are really hard on ourselves of, you know, what parenting, especially moms and dads can be really hard on themselves of like, Oh, I'm doing it. Am I doing things right? Am I raising my kid correctly? Are they going to turn out to be a good person? And I think if you care, if you're thinking about that, if that's even a thought in your mind that you're worried about being a good parent, you probably already are a good parent. Um, and that just continue to, to learn as much as you can so that you can, you know, be the, the best mom that you can be. And also you're already a really good mom is what I taught myself. Awesome. I love that. That is great. Well, folks, that is what yeah. I've got for you in today's episode. Where can people find you, Meredith? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the everyday health coach is my handle. Um, I'm Meredith Bauman on Facebook. So you can find me on there as well, but I'm pretty active on my Instagram pretty much every day. So at the everyday health coach and yeah, I'd love if you came and gave me a follow. That'd be great. Cool. Well, folks, if you love today's episode, please do me a favor right now. Take a screenshot, share it on your Instagram stories, and tag me with my handle at Dapper Dude Kyle, along with at the Everyday Health Coach. That is one of the ways that we grow. And until next time, keep up the kindness, and I hope your day treats you as good as you look.